All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 24, Section 2, Transformation and Backlash. So we've actually kind of already alluded a little bit to uh, this backlash that was taking place during the 1920s. Uh, but before we had talked about the progressive movement and really US involvement in World War I, and really what both of those things did was demand, really people in America demanded a return to normalcy. So there already is kind of this idea that, uh, you know, a lot of change had taken place on this front. Now there's a desire to kind of go back to the way things were. And this continues to play out during the 1920s in a number of different ways as well. One of them is in the form of nativism, which is, which can be best sort of described as uh, maybe sort of a, we'll just say a fear of outsiders. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be fear. It could be sort of a hostility or maybe even concern, maybe reservations. Uh, but this was largely due in part to a lot of the new immigration that was taking place coupled with what was going on in Russia in the form of the Russian Revolution. So this nativism backlash is due a lot to immigration and political, um, uh, political happenings overseas in the form of the Ru Russian Revolution. Uh, again, nativism, hostility, fear, concern of outsiders. You'd had all during the early 1900s a series of anarchist assassinations. Uh, William McKinley, the U.S. president was assassinated in 1901, along with a lot of other world leaders. And so uh, this really raised sort of suspicion over potentially people coming from overseas with radical political ideas wanting to disrupt the United States. We might also couple this with something we talked about in the previous chapter, and that was the Red Scare, you know, sort of this fear about uh, communism in the United States. And uh, a good example of this during the 1920s was the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. These were two immigrants from Italy. They were anarchists. Yeah, they're here, Sacco and Vanzetti. And they were accused of murder. And given the sort of atmosphere, the strong nativist sentiment, uh, both of them were executed with very little evidence. So they were put to death. with little evidence. And it's believed that uh, really all they were guilty of was being foreign born, uh, not speaking English and having radical political views given the climate of the time. Nativism also translated into stricter immigration laws. In fact, during the 1920s, you have some of the strictest immigration laws in all of American history. Both the Emergency Immigration Act of 1921 and the National Origins Act of 1924 pretty much do the same thing, and that is they limit immigration based on national origin. In other words, um, what they did was they looked at the US census in 1890, which was 30 years ago, uh, and said, well, if only 5% of the population in 1890 was Italian, then we're only letting in, in terms of immigration, 5% can come from Italy. So this was a way of kind of going back before many of the new immigrants arrived, right? Before these new immigrants arrived and limiting and restricting immigration from those groups in particular. So these were Southern Europeans like Italians. These were Eastern Europeans like Russians and Jews. Whereas other immigrant groups who had come before that uh, weren't really impacted by these laws. Uh, this wasn't the first time the United States prohibited immigration based off national origin. Recall the Chinese Exclusion Act was the very first time that the United States determined immigration based off you know, where you were born. Here you have kind of a much stricter law that restricts a number of groups, typically those groups who were newly arriving to the country at the time. Another way that nativism um, really sort of, um, uh, nativism came to the forefront was with the re-emergence of the Ku Klux Klan. Now recall, this was an organization that came about during Reconstruction to really take away 
political rights of African Americans. And that's really what the uh, Klan was in business doing. But during Reconstruction, because of the effort by President Grant, by the Radical Republicans, a strong military force more or less put the Klan out of business. In the 1920s, it reemerges, and it reemerges in a slightly different way. It's an organization that really bases its um, you know, whole you know, outlook and goal on the slogan of white, Protestant, and Anglo-Saxon. It was largely inspired, this revival, by the film The Birth of a Nation in 1915. Here you see a poster for The Birth of a Nation here. This was a movie which portrayed the KKK as the heroes, uh, kind of the heroes of the South. So that did a lot to motivate this kind of second version of the Klan. And rather than being just strictly opposed to the political rights of African Americans, it was now uh, much more involved in anti-immigration laws. It was uh, anti-Catholic, it was anti-Jewish. Uh, so this sort of point about Protestantism was much more uh, central to the Klan in this form. It call, we call it the second Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. This was actually the time where the Klan had its highest, highest membership. Uh, many more people belonged to the Klan in the 20s than did, you know, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And in fact, a lot more than the Klan when it reemerges in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s to really battle against the civil rights movement. And some of the ways that this Klan was different than the Klan of Reconstruction was first geography. So it was north and south. The Klan before had really only been a southern um, organization, but it becomes much more of a, you know, more geographically diverse now, and also its activity. So, you know, the terror, the violence, the intimidation, that's all part of it. But in the 1920s, the Klan is also much more involved in kind of mainstream politics, you know, maybe things like, you know, fundraising, uh, things like uh, political activity. So this version of it, again, is a little bit more widespread in the type of activities that it does and uh, is much more mainstream in American society. We typically don't think of the 1920s as being the height of the Klan, uh, but it certainly was in the United States. Uh, lastly, the last backlash that we'll talk about is the conflict between urban and rural. We might also say this is the conflict between religion and really kind of like modern uh, maybe not just modern science, but really modern sensibilities or modernism. And the way that this urban-rural conflict manifested itself was a couple of different ways. So the 1920s marked the first time that the number of movie theaters was greater than the number of churches, which is a significant kind of cultural shift in the United States. It's also the time period when more people lived in the cities than in the rural areas. So the country is going through a very very sort of dramatic shift, right? I mean, it, it's the United States is going from a rural country, an agricultural country, which, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson had envisioned it being all the way back in, in you know, 1803 or whatever. Uh, and it's moving into an urban area. And there is a sense of heightened conflict due to that. Uh, it manifests itself in the Scopes monkey trial of the 1920s, or other words called the Scopes trial. And this revolved around Darwin's, oops, ideas about evolution. Uh, the Butler Act, so it took place in Tennessee, that was the state. I don't know if you spell Tennessee that way, but anyways. The Butler Act made it illegal to teach evolution. Uh, Scopes, who was the teacher, you know, pretty much openly taught it and he was brought before uh, brought before the court in this trial and so this trial was really kind of a uh, a version of you know evolution versus the bible in some sorts and it became a very public trial because william jennings bryant who was the uh, you know he had ran for president i think like three times he had failed to win the white house he was the populist candidate in 1896 
he came to defend the fundamentalist. And if you're unfamiliar with the term fundamentalist, it just means literal interpretation. So those that believed in the literal interpretation of the Bible, AKA the story of Genesis, as opposed to Darwin's theory of evolution. So William Jennings Bryan came to defend the fundamentalist uh, position in this trial. He was one of the lawyers and this was broadcast on the radio. And again, you know, the radio really allowed this to go and, and reach the entire American audience. And just in this small trial in Tennessee about teaching evolution in classrooms, this really became kind of a symbol of all of those forces that were uh, associated with the city, with uh, modern sensibilities, and then the countryside, which was much more clearly kind of in the religious and more fundamentalist camp. And one thing that's very interesting is that even though in the trial scopes lost, but you know William Jennings Bryant was kind of made to look like a fool, um, that even though new technologies like radios were kind of, again, part of this modern world, it was utilized by some preachers in order to reach massive audiences. So radio broadcast services, in fact, some of the most popular radio services were those that were related to religion. And you had preachers like uh, Amy Simple McPherson, who was a radio preacher, uh, reach massive audiences. There are some that suggest that the 1920s could also be described as a great awakening of sorts because of the power that the radio had to reach large audiences, a lot more people became more religious as a result of that.